Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to talk about some core concepts in the study of MIS. So, let's get right into it. MIS stands for Management Information Systems. It is the management and use of information systems that help organizations achieve strategies. Those strategies typically being making money, very important. But what actually is an information system? Well, that is a system that produces information and that system is going to be comprised of many, many, many different parts. Those parts are going to include the actual hardware and software that you're using. Now I described hardware and software in computing fundamentals. Uh, hardware is going to be the actual machines that you're using, the computers that you're actually using or the servers that you either install in your business or the servers that you're renting from another company. That all is the hardware. The software is going to be all the, well, all the software that you're using. So everything from the operating system to the applications that you're using, like possibly the Microsoft Office suite of applications or OneDrive or anything like that. We also got data. Data is all just stuff. It is numbers. It is uh, observations that you've made about users. It's all stuff that is communicated electronically to you not necessarily electronically, but when we're talking about computer data, it would be communicated electronically to you. And that you would want to use in order to, well, make money. We have the procedures. The procedures are everything from how you organize the actual company or organize the system or something like that. It's how you pass inputs and outputs to and from components of your system. It's the flow of data and information. It's the, um, the security procedures to make sure that no bad actors are accessing everything that you have. All of those like company rules or uh, specifications that you have to follow in order to ideally maximize profit from the work that you're doing. And then finally, the people, the people who are actually putting work into the system are what give that system value because you can have all the computers, you can have all the software, you can try to automate as much as you can with machine learning, but fundamentally at some point you need people in your system, whether they're organizing the system themselves or whether they are building the tools that you need or working, you know, doing work with the data or stuff like that. You don't, you can't get value out of a system without having people in there somewhere. No matter how much you try to automate, you still need people to some extent. Now, information systems sound pretty similar to another term that you might have heard called information technology. Information technology is specifically the products, methods, and standards used to produce information. So that is the hardware that you're buying the services that you are renting, the services that you might be creating, or the rules that you make in terms of how the services are used within your company and stuff like that. That all is information technology. They sound similar, but there are some very key differences. The biggest difference between information tech and information systems is that you can buy information technology. You can buy all those computers. You can buy all that software, all of that kind of stuff but you have to create the information system from that information tech. You have to put all that technology in the right place. You have to hire the people to run that information technology. You have to create the workflow yourself. And managing an information system, managing all of the people who are a part of it, managing the workflows and the methods that you use, all of that is MIS. All of that is information systems management. The management of information systems is what we are primarily talking about in this class. This is how you make yourself valuable in this sense. 
as a person who is a part of a business, it is your job to know the systems that fall under your position. And this doesn't just mean if you're a manager, you have to know the entire system that you are managing, right? Let's say you are working as a marketer. You still have a system that you have to manage. You have systems for collecting user data. Maybe that system is being created by someone who is, has a lot of technical knowledge, right? But at some point you are getting that user data. You have to interpret that user data. You have to figure out how to transform that data into effective marketing for your company. So you, in a sense, are building an information system to accomplish that process and you have to be able to manage it. Whether that information system includes people who aren't you or whether that information system is just you and the software and hardware you're working with and the procedures that you are making in order to create that effective marketing, that's still an information system that you have to learn how to effectively manage. So at every level of a business, there is an information system that you're working with and there that means that you have to manage that information system. So no matter what you're trying to do, whether you're getting into marketing or accounting or actual management, management of information systems is vital. Now, what's important to mention is that management of an information system doesn't just mean, you know, creating the system or if your system needs something, adding something to it or just making sure that the system is running great, right? Another key part of managing an information system is knowing when adding something to your system would actually be bad. It might cause problems, you might waste resources, or you might completely destroy your system, and it would be a really bad thing. So as an example, going back to this marketing idea, imagine that you are in charge of a marketing department and your boss comes up to you and says, hey, everybody is getting really into AI-generated art. I want you to incorporate that into your marketing strategies and then just walks off. You need to be able, instead of just saying, you know, yes to it because this person is your boss, right? You need to be able to evaluate your system, evaluate these AI art generating technologies and decide whether or not that's a good idea. You need to evaluate the technology and say, okay, well, why do we need it? What benefit does it give us to use this service? Does the cost of either developing a service like this or renting out a service that has already been developed, does that outweigh the benefits that we would get from, say, possibly saving money by automatically generating material that we can use in marketing? You have to ask yourself all these kinds of questions. You have to be able to do the research into the systems in order to go back to your boss and say, no, I don't think this is a good idea. And here is why with all the facts and figures and calculations and experiments that you've done. Or to go back to your boss and say, here is how we can effectively implement this into our strategy. I want to bring up another example of this. I want you to think about how many people jumped on cryptocurrency because it was being touted as the new investment. People were seeing it as a new stock market that they could get into. They're seeing NFTs as new assets that without question would appreciate in value that they could then sell off later. Imagine how many people were doing that without the technical knowledge of what cryptocurrency is. What is a blockchain? How are things validated on the blockchain? What is the cost of mining cryptocurrency? What are the forces that actually make cryptocurrency theoretically increase in value over time? How many people lost everything because they couldn't see through the jargon and realize some of the negatives to investing in cryptocurrency like that. How many people lost everything because they saw all the jargon, they saw a bunch of people coming in and they didn't realize that a lot of these cryptocurrency opportunities were just rug pulls waiting to happen. How many people were trying to, you know, 
overlook people who were offering criticism of these certainties, dismissing them because they were spreading FUD, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, before losing everything on the market, right? I want you to keep examples like this in mind as you go forward, because this is the importance of being able to evaluate a system. And not only that, if you don't have the knowledge to evaluate a system yourself, of figuring out who is an expert in this, who can I go to in order to figure out what I need to know about making this decision? Who can I talk to about this? Who, who can I gain information about to determine if a certain solution is the right solution for me? A fun exercise I want to offer you is to pretend that you are working at a company and your boss says, I want to put medical records on the blockchain. I want to use the blockchain to validate people's medical records so they know that there's no, you know, mistakes in their medical records. How would you go about finding out if that's a good idea? And do you think that's a good idea? I'm not going to grade you on this, but it's a fun question, I think. If you want to get some experience learning about what the blockchain is, learning about the different laws that go around the sharing of medical records and whether or not this may or may not be a good idea. No pressure to do it, but might be fun to try. Anyway, I talk a lot about data and information, and information is used in the three big acronyms that we've just been talking about for quite a while now, but I never defined information. What is information? How much time do you have? Because there, there are a lot of different ways of talking about information. There are people who spend entire graduate degrees formulating things about information. What makes information information? How can we preserve information? How can we get information? How do we store information? How can we compress it and uncompress it? Entropy, all that kind of stuff. Information science is absolutely fascinating and we do not have time to cover it. So let's talk about information at a higher level and let's talk about it in terms of data. Data are recorded facts or figures. We get user interaction data from, you know, seeing what websites people click on, what, what actual links people click on on our websites. Amazon gets a lot of user interaction data specifically from the searches that people make, the links that they click on, whether they add them to certain wish lists with certain names or whether they add them to the cart immediately and buy, all that kind of stuff. That is all recorded facts about what people are doing. And then the figures that they're referring to here are could be the numbers, the actual numerical data that you might get from in terms of like time spent looking at a website or time spent looking at an ad or time spent before skipping a video on YouTube or something like that, or it might be the graphs that you make out of data points. Now, information, on the other hand, is the knowledge that we derive from data. It's what we get when we look at data and we say, oh, well, this is what that data means. This is what that data can tell us about our customers, or our sales performance, or whatever we're trying to learn about from that data. When we actually have learned something useful, that is information. It's data presented in a meaningful context. So I talked about graphs earlier, but when we actually have, you know, a graph with proper labels so we can see what this graph is representing, when we have lines of best fit that show, you know, this is what we can expect things to look like in the future, assuming things continue to progress in the same way. We can also consider information to be data having undergone a transformation into 
something meaningful. We apply some sort of pro process in order to understand what that data means. So if we have a whole bunch of user watch times on a video, you know, that's just a whole bunch of like, user one, watch this amount, user two, watch this amount, user three, watch this amount. But if we transform that data and we say, okay, well, what part of the video are people not watching? Then we can see what useful thing users are getting out of this. Maybe they say, okay, well, they are skipping my sponsored segment at the end of this video. So maybe I should instead put the sponsor segment at the beginning so that they have to watch it in order to watch the rest of the video, right? In this one example of YouTube watch time. This is an example of processing data, which is the watch time, into information, the part that users are skipping, and then using that to inform future decisions, the decision to put a sponsor segment at the beginning of a video. Any good information system aims to create meaning from data. Collecting data is easy, but when you're building an information system, you want to take that data and you want to actually get information out of it. A system value lies in the information it can extrapolate. I gave the example of the marketing agent getting uh, data about users and using that to inform their marketing. The information system the, the information that your marketing system, your marketing information system should be able to create is stuff like users' interests that you can then exploit into making marketing material or the products that users are buying that you can then use to say, okay, well, we're going to focus on pushing this product even further because users really seem to like it or we're going to do this type of marketing on the less popular products so more people buy it or something like that. That is how a marketing person's user system would be creating meaning from data. And if it's creating good information from that data, then that marketing person, that, that marketing person's system and consequently that marketing person themselves are both very valuable in the business. This is the reason why Facebook and Google and Amazon have so much net worth because they have extremely powerful systems that can extrapolate a huge amount of data from, or a huge amount of information from user data. They're able to create these horrifyingly complete profiles on their users based on the data, based on the huge amount of data that they're actually getting from their users. An example of this is Facebook creating what's known as shadow profiles for people who don't actually exist on Facebook, but yet that they're able to infer exist as people through their friends that have Facebook. So if you don't personally have a Facebook, but you're ending up in a lot of Facebook photos that your friends are taking, they're taking a lot of photos with you and then they're putting them on Facebook. Facebook knows that, they, that you exist, they have created a shadow profile about you and they are trying to figure out what your interests are so then they could possibly market to you. That kind of technology, the technology to not just understand people on an individual level, but also on a community level to make these giant graph theoretical models about people that is what gives Facebook and, or I guess they're called Meta now. I, I hate that they're called Meta, to be honest, but Meta and Google and Amazon, all of that is why they are so valuable as companies. And hey, if you want to learn the finer details about the horrifying amount of information they're able to collect on you and how they're able to collect that horrifying amount of information, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, we just don't quite have time for it in this video, unfortunately. Information is derived from data, so necessarily that means that information relies on data. And not only that, but the value of information is bounded 
by how good that data actually is. Now, what I mean by that is that your information can only be as good as your data is. Now, you can have bad information come from good data, especially if there's a flaw in your information system or something like that. But you can't have really, 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 really good information come from mid to low quality data. If you have bad data, then the best information that you can get out of that is we need to get better data. So you can only get valuable information from good data. Now let's talk about the characteristics that actually make data good. Your data has to be accurate. It has to accurately reflect the world and it has to accurately reflect specifically the things that you're trying to measure using that data. So for the YouTube watch time example, right? If you are figuring, if you're trying to figure out where your users stop actually watching the videos, you need to make sure that that is indeed where they stop watching the videos. If the numbers are wrong, you might get a wrong impression that like, oh, well, this part of the video was bad and I shouldn't do that kind of thing in the future. When in reality, maybe a lot of users liked that. And then for whatever reason, the watch time data is, you know, whatever functions were collecting that watch time data messed up and you're getting bad data. Another example might be the number of clicks that you're actually getting on different advertisements, um, if people are actually clicking those advertisements or not. And if you're getting a lot more clicks than users actually clicking on the ads, if you have like bots that are clicking your ads for you, you might get the, imp the impression that certain products that were being advertised are actually more popular than they really were, when in reality, Maybe someone is like maliciously clicking ads in order to make you waste resources, or maybe there's some scheme to try to get maximum ad revenue by clicking ads and stuff like that, and you are kind of on the butt end of that. So you need to make sure that the data that's coming in is actually accurate. You need to have measures in place to actually verify the accuracy of that data, especially when you're creating a new system for the first time. You don't want to be relying on inaccurate data. The next uh, good characteristic is timeliness. So if you wait a long time between collecting your data and actually trying to get information from that data, that data may not be relevant anymore. And a really simple example of this is if you are running marketing for a store and in September and October, a lot of users are buying Halloween decorations, right? So then in January, maybe you're doing, you're running uh, some algorithms to see, you know, how much people are buying certain products. And you see this huge spike in people buying Halloween decorations and you say, okay, that's fantastic. People love Halloween decorations. We should just start stocking Halloween decorations right now and start pushing these really hard with our marketing. You might flop with that because people, I mean, okay. To be fair, there's a lot of people who are in the Halloween mood all year round, but not enough to actually make a business off of them, unfortunately. Except for one business. There's one business in San Luis Obispo that's like a 24-7 Halloween store. I don't know how they're still open, but they, you know, they keep on trucking. But you probably won't have that kind of resources to run a year-round Halloween promotion kind of thing and actually make a lot of you know, money off of it. There's a reason why Spirit Halloween isn't around all year round. So in that example, what really hurt you was the timeliness of your data. Because you waited three months or so to actually evaluate your data, you then come to the conclusion that like, oh, okay, well, a lot of people are into Halloween. We need to push that stuff right now. And that could lead to disaster. So you got to stay on top of your data. You have to know how long it's going to be relevant for, and when it's no longer relevant, you have to throw it out or, you know, archive it so that you can use it for like histograms or something like that. But you have to collect new stuff and use it in a timely manner. Another 
good characteristic of data is relevance. And that relevance is going to be specifically re relevance to your system, to the projects that you're trying to work on. So if you are an accountant, is customer data relevant to you? No, the data that's going to be relevant to you is data about employee pay because your systems are probably going to be calculating things like uh, median pay, average pay, pay to work performance, like all that kind of stuff. You're not really going to be worried about the customer side of things. And similarly, if you're in marketing, you're not going to be worried about data about employee pay. Well, okay, you should be worried about your pay and your coworkers' pay to make sure that you all are being paid fairly in any company. That's a really big important thing, but for your information system, it doesn't happen to be relevant in that case. So data relevance is really important to having good information. If you have a lot of irrelevant data, then your information that you're getting out of that is only going to be confused. It's going to be obfuscated in some way. You're not really going to be able to actually get a clear picture of what's going on and that decreases the quality of the information that you're getting. Now, in a similar aspect to what I was just talking about, your data should be just barely sufficient. You should have enough data to actually perform the tasks that you're trying to, but then you shouldn't have much more than that for the same reason that I just talked about. If you have too much data, it can be really, really hard to uh, actually get meaningful information out of there. If you are doing marketing for a computer company like Apple or something like that, you're trying to figure out how much, you know, like what products people are buying, how many people are buying a certain product, and you're trying to compare that across Apple's line of products and maybe going back a few years to compare like growth in consumer base or shrinkage in consumer base, right? Does it makes sense to go all the way back to the year 2000 and look at, you know, or like the early 2000s and look at the early iPods? Or does it make more sense to maybe restrict the data that you're working with to the past couple of years to see consumer growth in more recent times with more relevant product lines? So you shouldn't be taking too much data just in case or something like that. Your data should be sufficient to accomplish the tasks that you're doing, but just barely so. Much more than that, and you get confused. And finally, data should be worth its cost. I talk about information systems having a certain value based on the information that they're able to get. Well, then that's going to be based on, you know, that, that information system's value is then necessarily based on the value of the data. And if you're not getting enough data out, like enough value out of your data, then it's not going to be worth the cost. It costs money to generate data. Whether you're doing that yourself, that means, you know, running machine learning systems on your own servers that has a hardware cost, a software cost, a personnel cost, because someone actually has to make those systems. It has an electricity cost, all that kind of stuff. Or if you're outsourcing it, to another company, which, you know, they have their own costs and they're trying to make a profit. So they're charging you a certain amount to actually collect that data. No matter what, data always has some sort of associated cost. And that cost has to be less than the amount of value that you're getting out of your system. So data has to be worth its cost in order to have good information because the value of information, the, the monetary value of information is included in terms of, you know, how valuable that information is. So these are the core fundamentals of information systems. It's all about information, the systems that generate information from data. It's all about data and, you know, the actual management of those information systems, which that is going to play a huge role in any position that you take no matter what so thank you all very much for watching in the next chapter we're going to or in the next video my apologies we're going to talk about ethics